It was uh, around this time last year that I became leader of the Liberal Party of Canada. And so it was around this time last year that the Conservatives aired the first of many of their attack ads featuring me. <laughs> now I've been asked over the year many times why, why, why I, why we, don't take the same approach. Goodness knows they've given us enough to work with. But my answer is always the same. I prefer the sunny ways championed by our first French-Canadian Prime Minister, Wilfrid Laurier. When he talked about sunny ways, Laurier was referring to Aesop's fable, the North Wind and the Sun. The wind and the sun argue about who is stronger, who could take, get a traveler to take off his coat first. The wind blusters and blows, but the traveler just holds on to his coat tighter and tighter. When it's the sun's turn, all he has to do is shine down warmly, and the traveler willingly removes his coat. What I want you to take away from that story is the essence of what Laurier meant when he used the term sunny ways. It's a story about persuasion being superior to force. It reminds us that kindness trumps aggression. J'adore cette histoire. Évidemment, cette méthode ne plaît pas à tout le monde. Ceux qui la critiquent disent que quiconque préfère le dialogue parle de tolérance, d'acceptance et de compassion est naïf. Autrement dit, mieux vaut se plaindre, arrêter de se plaindre et de contenter de ce qu'on a. Mais où nous mène cette vision des choses? Where does it take us? We saw Monday night in Quebec. What happens when a government chooses to divide instead of unite? When people choose to play up division instead of pulling people together? It's a way that doesn't suit most of the Canadians I know, and it doesn't suit me either. So with a positive approach, today I'm going to talk about the Canadian economy where it's been and where it's going, and about the big things we need to get right. Because there's still much room for improvement, even if many of the people in this room are doing fairly well. I know you'd agree with me when we say that better is possible. We can leave a better country, a stronger economy, a fairer, more compassionate society to our kids. Indeed, if we take our responsibilities seriously as political leaders, as business leaders, as citizens, we must aim for nothing less. In my job, I get to travel all across the country and see firsthand how economic success in one corner of Canada can benefit it all. But lately, I've seen a troubling trend. Middle-class Canadians are starting to doubt their future. They worry about sending their kids to college or university. They worry a lot about their own retirement years. They wonder if, when that time comes, they will leave their kids with a better country than the one they inherited from their parents. And they wonder if anyone is going to be able to help. It's time for a little full disclosure. I have never worked as an economist, but he hasn't either, just in case you were wondering and thought we had nothing in common. <laughs> now, economists do important work for us, but we need to be mindful of context when it comes to things like GDP, trade balances, and productivity numbers. Here's a chart that shows that after eight years in office, Mr. Harper has the worst economic growth record of any Prime Minister since the 1930s, R.B. Bennett. I'll admit that while I like the red parts of the graph, I don't necessarily like where things are headed. For me, a strong economy is pretty simple. It's one that provides the largest possible number of good jobs to the largest number of Canadians. From one end of this country to the other, 
There are Canadians who work to make ends meet for themselves and their families. People who depend on their incomes, their paychecks, not their assets, to get by. So let's take a look at how well middle-class Canadians are doing, given all their hard work. This graph shows us that Canada's economy has more than doubled in size over the past three decades. Since then, middle-class family incomes have risen by only about 15%. They haven't had a raise, not a real one, in 30 years. For Canada's middle class, the only thing that has kept pace with GDP growth is household debt. And before we blame that on new TVs and luxury items, think about how you spend your household dollars. It's the cost of things we need, like healthy food and school supplies that has risen dramatically in recent years, way beyond the general inflation rate. The same is true for post-secondary tuition, something that Canadians rely on for upward mobility. No wonder so many Canadians feel that they're working harder than ever and not getting any further ahead. But that's not true for everyone. Here's that 15% median income growth again. Now, let's take a look at Canada's wealthiest 1%. They're earning six figures more than they were 30 years ago. And the wealthiest 0.1%, well, even though they took a little hit during the recession, their incomes are up by more than half a million dollars a year. Now, I'm all for folks doing well, but here's the thing. There are far too many people who aren't sharing in our country's success. The millions de Canadiens de la classe moyenne ont du mal à payer leur hypothèque et la facture d'épicerie. Et des millions d'autres travaillent avec acharnement chaque jour dans l'espoir de faire partie de cette classe moyenne. In the fall of 2012, when I announced my candidacy for the leadership of the Liberal Party of Canada, I also announced that my economic priority was strengthening the middle class. Since then, the Conservative government has spent a lot of their time and a fair bit of your money trying to convince Canadians that the middle class is fine. The Prime Minister said that there is no better country in the world to be in the middle class. And his jobs minister, Jason Kenney, actually called the middle class challenges, get this, a myth. Instead, they like to wave around a StatsCan report that shows that due to rising housing prices, families' net worth has increased in recent years. That's great, but if you sell your house, you still have to buy a house. And anyway, you shouldn't have to sell your house to make ends meet until the grocery store accepts a picture of your condo as payment for your cauliflower. Rising housing prices are not a solution to our problem particularly given what's happening to household debt. We're now carrying more household debt in Canada than families in the U.S. and the U.K., with some troubling results. It means that Canadians aren't saving for what they need for their kids' education, for their retirement. CIBC estimates that the average 35-year-old puts aside less than half of what their parents did at the same age. Like I said, the Conservatives don't like that I'm focused on the middle class. But I'm happy to have started a real discussion about the real challenges that so many people are facing. It's a conversation that's long overdue. We need sustained eco economic growth to give the middle class some confidence that their family's economic future will be bright. And that confidence is essential. Because when Canadians are worried about making ends meet, it becomes harder to solve every other problem we face as a nation. We get anxious. We feel we're not reaching our potential. We argue. We point fingers. We blame others. The deeper the anxieties, the deeper the divisions. This has real consequences for all of us. Middle-class Canadians voted over the past decades for a growth agenda because they were told that growth would benefit them. If it doesn't, 
they will withdraw their support. And we're already seeing evidence of the start of this. Protectionism is rising in some quarters, while in others we hear doubts about the value of resource development. At the ballot box, we're seeing people vote for leaders who offer stories about who to blame for our problems, rather than ideas on how to solve them. It's a very, very windy worldview. So that's the bad news. But by now, you're more than ready for a little good news. Our federal fiscal position is strong. Because of some tough choices that Canadians made in the 1990s, our government is in a far better position than it once was, even with the successive deficits of recent years. This image shows our net debt to GDP ratio. That's the ratio of what our government owes compared to the size of our economy. In the mid-1990s, our debt represented 70% of the size of our economy. Today, it's less than half that. The US and the UK, they dream of being where we were in 1995. The world has learned there are clear benefits when economic growth and fiscal responsibility go hand in hand. I don't believe that government can solve all our problems, nor should it try. But I do believe that it's the Prime Minister's job to get the big things right. There are five things in particular I feel need our attention. First, we have to remember that Canada's greatest strength is Canadians. I used to teach here in Vancouver, so this is a special interest of mine. But if we can raise our post-secondary education attainment rate to 70%, we will have a workforce ready to meet Canada's future job market needs. If we better support Canadian students through loan payments geared to income, personal RESPs, or public-private not-for-profit not partnerships, we will improve opportunities for all Canadians. We also need to remember that Canada has flourished because of people coming here from every corner of the world and choosing to work hard to build success for themselves, their families, and their communities. Immigration has always played and will always play a central role in our economy. We need to welcome nation builders, help them thrive, and encourage their entrepreneurial spirits, not just hire workers or employees. Second, we need to be more strategic about foreign direct investment and trade. I don't need to tell you that. Here in BC, you're facing the Canadian economy's future. The US will always be important to us, but the present and future of global growth is in Asia. No place in the world is better positioned to take advantage of that growth than Vancouver and BC. We need smart policy to help you do that. And for all Canadians, trade is a good thing, an essential thing. Jobs in competitive export sectors pay 50% higher wages than in industries that are not trade intensive. That's good news for the middle class and the communities they call home. That's why we chose not to play politics with the recently announced free trade agreement with the Republic of Korea as well as the agreement in principle with the European Union. We're broadly supportive of those agreements as a party. And I said so to Mr. Harper on the floor of the House of Commons. A third opportunity, and one that is also of special interest to British Columbians, has to do with Canada's natural resources. How to reconcile economic growth with environmental stewardship. Because let's be perfectly clear. Pretending in the 21st century that we have to choose between one or the other is not only wrong, it's actually harmful. But this challenge is made even more difficult when the government's preferred way of dealing with its detractors is to demonize them. Dismissing those with genuine concerns as foreign radicals or terrorists. Building partnerships between industry, First Nations and civil society, as has been done with great success here in the BC forestry industry, well, that takes hard work. It demands real, courageous leadership. 
pipelines and LNG projects call for that same hard work. The federal government's role is to create a framework that helps Canadians grow the economy and protect the environment. It's not the government's role to put its thumb on the scale of any particular project in favour of the proponent or the opponent. If it does, as Mr. Harper's government has done far too often, it compromises the integrity of the process and prevents proponents from getting the social license they need to build the projects and create jobs, but it also undermines the public confidence that the environment is getting the protection that it needs. Let me be very clear on this point. Governments issue permits, but communities grant permission. Last October, I surprised a lot of people by going to Washington, D.C. and telling a room full of American Democrats that this Canadian Liberal supports the Keystone XL pipeline. I do. But I also understand their issues with it. If Canada had had stronger, more credible environmental policies in place, the Americans would have approved Keystone XL a long time ago. It's increasingly clear to everybody but Mr. Harper, consensus building is the only responsible way to turn resource opportunities into economic realities. We need to draw on our intelligence, on our ability and willingness to solve problems as much as we draw on the resources themselves. As Prime Minister, I would see it as one of my core responsibilities to facilitate this kind of engagement. Over the long term, that is the only way that we can leverage our natural resources in a way that is sustainable, maximizes economic opportunity, and strengthens the middle class. Fourth, we need to take a hard look at what we can do to foster innovation. We've spent billions on research, but lag behind our competitors on productivity. I'm proud of the fact that Wilfrid Laurier shares space with Canadarm2 and Dexter on our new $5 bill. But I'm also eager to find out what technology might be featured there 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Those new ideas and the high-paying, skilled jobs that come with them will be critical to our future growth. And finally, we need new leadership when it comes to infrastructure investment. At a time when our cities are starved for capital, the government cut its core infrastructure program by nearly 90 percent. To spend more down the road, but I think you'll understand my multiple levels of skepticism about a promise Mr. Harper won't need to keep for five or six years. I believe that it's unrealistic of the federal government to ask our towns and cities to wait another half decade to repair crumbling bridges and make other necessary upgrades to roads, water, and transit systems. Infrastructure investments do more than just create good jobs. They improve our quality of life. Look at the dividends from the Pacific Gateway. Look at the Canada Line. Alors, pendant que nous sommes dans l'opposition, nous continuerons de nous battre pour inverser cette réduction de 87 Et lors des prochaines élections, nous offrirons aux Canadiens des solutions qui mettent l'investissement dans les programmes d'infrastructures publiques long terme à l'avant-plan. Nous devons prendre des mesures positives et constructives pour que ce pays aille de l'avant. Et nous y arriverons en nous concentrant sur les gens, sur le commerce, sur la gestion intelligente de nos ressources naturelles, sur l'innovation et sur les investissements en infrastructure. With Canadians, our caucus, and the grassroots of the Liberal Party, we have started doing an awful lot of work to build the platform for the election in 2015. These are some of the core policy areas you will see in that platform. And when we get these priorities right, we will strengthen the middle class and, as a result, our entire economy. I believe that if we ask the right questions, if we engage in open and honest dialogue, 
If we take a hard look at the evidence and learn from our mistakes, Canadians will solve every challenge that comes our way. But we won't solve anything if all we're worried about are tomorrow's headlines, next quarter's report, or the next election. I worry that the current government has forgotten something fundamental. Our job, the job of the Government of Canada, is to work with Canadians to build a stronger country. It's not the government's role to pit one region against another or to appeal to our worst instincts and fears about one another. That might have proven in the past to be a decent strategy to win an election, but it's no way to build a country. People have said that the only reason I'm in this job as leader of the Liberal Party is because of my family. They're right. I have a six-week-old baby at home. For me, personally, the stakes are incredibly high. But the opportunities are equal to the challenges, as are Canadians. I will always believe, no matter what the next round of negative attacks say, that persuasion and kindness are the paths we should choose. And I will always believe, because I have seen it here in Vancouver and every community across this great country, that with a little hope and a lot of hard work, there is no problem that we can't solve together. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much.